Ryan and Melissa were waiting in an airport and an idea sparked. They were looking at that bridge and they thought, you know, that might address a very difficult challenge we have right now. They contacted that bridge manufacturer. They found out, in fact, that that could be used for a pedestrian bridge. It hadn't been done before. The owners of the company thought, gee, why not? We could supply you a bridge. Why don't we try and do that? Put that idea together with a contractor and initiated a strategy that led to this, December 13th. December 14th, December 15th, at one-third the cost, far superior product, a product that was installed in three days and enabled what would have been a six-month construction disruption to this multi-building campus to be three days. Uh, a think different story. Tim had listened to a talk by Jim Timberlake at our leaders forum a few years ago. Uh, Jim talked a lot about prefabrication. And within hours of that talk, an interesting idea sparked. They're working on a large medical center in the Midwest, about 200 rooms, and contemplating, well, now, how would you break this thing down? In fact, how, how might you consider prefabrication strategies for a hospital, very technical building? Well, it turns out that patient rooms have head walls, and they have bedrooms and they have these systems and you can sort of isolate those things and repeat that module and gee maybe there's even a way to transport that. Took that idea to the contractor to the owner, they got traction and they just executed what I think is the first prefabricated patient room strategy certainly in America. 300 percent increase in productivity. This entire operation took 18 workers and filled less than one dumpster. It was done in one-third the time. There were no injuries in the warehouse operation, no injuries. And as many of you know, there are a lot of injuries on construction sites that, that you wouldn't hear about every day, lacerations, eye injuries, broken bones, remarkable transformation. And here's one of these units being installed. So I want to talk a little bit about culture, the making of a culture that allows ideas like this to happen. I'm very fortunate to have been spending some time with Bruce Mao recently, and he's got a new book he's working on. And at least the working title is Let Go and Lead. I think that's very powerful. Really, really let go and lead. And our job as leaders in our firm is to serve those people right there. That's our job, to figure out how to get underneath them and enable their brilliance, enable the kind of creativity that I just reported in those two stories. This is a place where an idea doesn't care where it came from. So we've invested mightily in building a collaborative, horizontal, very empowered uh, culture, a role-based culture, really, uh, where creativity is the key to new ideas and innovation. So it's interesting to step back a little bit, think about some of the things we're all hitting. This is, I think, something like many of you might be engaged with, certainly the large firms here, a new city in China. This is Qingdao. And you know, typical predicament, 1,600 acres, you've got 40 days, millions of square feet to plan and design, and here's the brief, and we look forward to your submission. And it's those challenges that are showing us the way to the future. They're showing us the opportunities we have, because there's no option but to completely rethink how you work. There aren't more hours in the day to do that well. And last time I checked, none of us are going to be able to resist these forces, these forces of globalization. So we've got to figure out how to work different. Now, in this case, it provoked us to integrate four studios around the world virtually and work in a new networked way. Now, that was April 2009. This is April 2010. And you can go on Google Earth right now, and you can see this landform taking shape. And you think, wow, that's shocking. But I think, again, therein lies the opportunity. Speed, cost, productivity are forces that are driving the world forward. And 100 and, what is it, 130,000 architects in the U.S. aren't going to change that. So, so I'm very intrigued with the new ways of working, the new ways of collaborating and networking that would enable us to thrive in that context. This was an interesting photo. It's a mobile hospital in Haiti. It reminds me of the Cooper Hewitt exhibit where the question, why design now? 
I think is a very interesting question with ideas about, you know, here are ways in which design is part of the answer. And that image for me reminds me of the opportunity for design to make a difference in the way that hospital could work and serve those people in need. And it reminds us that where there's great need and crisis, there's opportunity. So jumping to Hangzhou, China, one of the little case studies I want to share. This is a groundbreaking of the new stadium, 85,000 seat outdoor stadium for the Asia Games. And this is a project for us which is really living uh, a new kind of practice future. So there's the, the concept, if you will. But here's the story. This young man, Nathan, is a mathematician. And just beyond is an industrial designer. And we also have other integrated specialists working together. And incidentally, you won't find a private office in our firm anywhere in the world. So it is about access and connection and communication. And, a, and a, a providing them the tools to innovate. So what they've constructed are a number of digital tools, parametric design tools and computational design tools that in this case enable what we call a bowl generator. So what two or three people are doing, and I submit doing better than the traditional large teams that preceded them, they're doing in a fraction of the time and more effectively. So briefly, uh, looking at a range of configurations, finding optimization between artistry and the pragmatics. This stadium for 85,000 seats is the same size as the bird's nest. It weighs one-third the weight. This was resolved by three people in weeks, not armies of architects and engineers in, in over months. These tools are interconnecting human performance characteristics to the design, as well as some of the rapid analysis uh, feedback that we would all hope to be advancing in our practices. This idea of proof at concept being so critical to value creation now that we're certainly trying to emphasize the role that all our staff have in understanding value creation. So optimal viewing characteristics, weight, sight lines, uh, energy efficiency uh, overlays, all of it is combined into a computational model. And what I want to highlight is every one of these seats, all 85,000 of them, comply to very specific anthropometric criteria for the tilt of the head and the sweep of the head. So we've tied that human performance characteristic to the seat in the model. We can develop the model. We pull on the model, twist the model, and those rules are respected. It's a big shift for us in delivering on the promise of human performance. So what are leaders doing? At NBBJ, we're, we're tracking our work around the globe. We call them exemplary sustainable projects, ESP projects, understanding the different climate conditions, understanding the different strategies. And we're benchmarking that work, and we're celebrating it. We're, we're making it visible. We share it uh, so that we can learn from it. If you were in our office in early 2008, you would have seen on the internet this announcement. We signed the 2030 challenge as a firm. And my partners and I kind of looked at each other, and are we going to do this? OK, yeah, we have to. We've got to set you know, those, those north stars that we're aiming for. But I would be lying if I didn't say I couldn't look out in the audience, at least that were in the office, that I happened to be in the time we talked about this, that they thought, you got, you, what a bunch of bozos up. Like, they're, they're really going to pull this off? Are, are people, do they really believe that we have that potential? Now, I agree with the comments earlier. The, the steps as they follow get much harder. But what amazed me is we just audited all our projects in the U.S. through the end of 2009, which was to get to that 50% reduction on the EUI measure from the, from the 2030 benchmark, and we did it. And I thought, wow, now how did that happen? I also agree. It was, it was the talent and the energy of our staff. It's the clients who are experiencing a significant awakening in the value this represents to their work and also legislation. All of that led to meeting that late 2009 benchmark. And I thought, well, that's a great signal of optimism and potential to get there. That's where we're at today. Behind that, 60% of our US projects met that benchmark. The size of those projects aggregate against the 100% brought the energy down 50%. That's 11 million square feet last year all run through energy models. But how are we expanding that influence? We're investing, and I think there's been some good commentary about the importance of investing in research. And we've been 
developing studies around reducing energy in hospitals. And what we know with the significant hospitals that we work with is they have typically two to four percent profit margins. And energy is well over two percent of their operating costs. Now it turns out hospitals use a lot of energy. And in fact, there are a number of strategies, very clear strategies, that we can reduce that energy by half. And so you're talking about a 25% to 50% increase to their operational bottom line. And that impact to their business on reinvestment, recruiting, those things is, is notable. What's exciting about this is it's been picked up by the DOE. So we're now working with the Department of Energy. We've been funded through a significant grant. And we're hoping to scale these ideas to the whole sector of healthcare and, and go beyond just the reach of even a large practice. So another project, we're building the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It's a large urban campus. It's a project that we've been working on for about the last seven years. And it's notable from, I think, a number of perspectives, not the least of which is its benefactors. And of course, you would expect it to represent uh, sound thinking in sustainable design excellence. I think while there are a number of strategies here that are noteworthy, it's, it's conventional from, from the perspective of, of pulling these things together, not unusual. Um, but what I can tell you is going back to, oh, about seven years ago, this was a client who said, look, we're, we're tracking on world health and US education. That's it. This will not be a sustainable design demonstration project but we'll be responsible. Um, we have a million gallon rainwater storage tank. We have thermal en energy storage um, capacity on the site that, that recycles cold energy overnight um, and, a, and a wide range of high performance features. But this is what I think is important. It's extending our skill and our aptitude with cost benefit proof and bringing intelligence to the argument. So there are many things I could touch on here, but the one I'll, I'll point out deals with the reduced cost in mechanical systems against an increased cost in the quality of the window wall. And bringing together sort of that multivariant case with an intelligent client allowed for significant increases in investments. Now, you think, wow, they have significant resources. That's true. But I know many of you have worked with clients like that. And in fact, my experience is the pressure on how every dollar is spent is, is far higher than, than what you might experience in your ordinary uh, environments. That's certainly the case here. So we benchmark our work. We looked at it in detail three years ago. I looked at it this year. We have about 130 significant projects moving through the practice. And out of that, we're tracking things like the quality of discovery, human experience that space should serve for performance, concept clarity, sustainable design. But the tough news is, I think, and we think as a group of leaders, that 25% of our work really hits the mark in terms of the expectations we've set. So our challenge is then, how does the 75 become the 25? And that's the orientation uh, of our strategies. We have 17 studios practicing around the world, and you can see how the evaluations have self-mapped uh, each of those studios. And, and sort of some of the uh, coincident uh, elevations in, in, in the, the realization of, of those goals. So we know that our job is to make this happen, to create an environment where creativity can thrive, where peer review, where collaboration, where workshops and charrettes, where when it's as good as it gets, what were you doing? That's what we want to create in our practice, and, and that's where great ideas are happening. Um, there's so many things to focus on, but this human experience piece is certainly something we've, we've been striving to differentiate around. That is to ask the question early, what is it about this place that, that can provoke or enable extraordinary performance within this client's enterprise? And, and how does space meet and serve that objective? How does it become a strategic advantage? And I like this image just because of the way it accommodates these two students, the way somehow that space anticipated what could happen there. Uh, perhaps this one is even more inspiring. This is a mobile science lab. This was a pro bono project. And our young designers also, through their own initiative, took on the challenge with one of our science clients. They said, well, we see you've got these vans that run around town. There's no, they're lacking design. We, we would love to get involved. In fact, they did. And I think that counter height 
and, and the color and, and the simple elements of de design have stimulated this boy in a way that gives me great, great opti optimism for the future. So what's our challenge? Designed to inspire life and human potential and shape the future we will inherit. Thank you.